भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवागम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवहित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्ष्यो अरिष्ट स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शांति 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 सो इन द मंडुक्य कार्य कवि इन द थर्ड चैप्टर वी वर डूइंग वर्स नंबर Sixteen, we were doing. So, what is going on here? I think we had a gap of one class. I was out in the Bahamas, not on a cruise. <laughs> um, there were there were classes in the Shivananda Yoga Ashram, so I gave talks on um, Aparoksha Nubhuti. and i met some interesting people one was a mathematician marcus du satoy you've heard of richard dawkins um so marcus is his successor there's there's a post for the popularization of science uh, it's a british government post in oxford university so richard dawkins held that until recently he retired from that post and marcus has taken it over but their approaches are different Richard Dawkins is well known as uh, a militant atheist absolutely nothing to do with not only nothing to do with religion attacking religion all the time Marcus uh, obviously has a different approach otherwise he wouldn't be sitting in the Sh- Shivananda ashram in um the Bahamas but uh, we got along well together and he was saying that he has taken an approach of a more conciliatory approach that means we can learn something from um different spiritual traditions and also at the same time have a dialogue with them and transmit um a scientific attitude so so that's why he's there and he, the topic which he's going to speak about is also interesting he is going to speak about um what we cannot know what we cannot know from a, it's from entirely from a science perspective uh, from a math and physics perspective so um we missed one class there So what was what is going on here in the third chapter it is called advaita prakaranam the the chapter on non duality and here gaurapada approaches the the claim that there is one non dual reality um and he approaches it through reasoning and also through appropriate quotations from the scriptures the way he does it is interesting he says that brahman the ultimate reality is neither a cause nor an effect Uh, what that means is this the way religion is usually we we look at it is there's something called god and which is the creator of the individual being in sanskrit jiva that's us individual beings and jagat the world us and the world so god is the creator and god has created individual beings like us and the entire world so in philosophical language god is the cause and these are the effects if by effects i mean products something has been made something new god made the world god made us and this is exactly what gaurapada denies um he says that see from the jeevas us we are not actually products or we are not emerged from brahman the ultimate reality we are brahman itself under ignorance under the spell of maya we think we are separate but really we are one consciousness and this entire world is actually not a product something that has been made by god it is rather none other than god or brahman the ultimate reality appearing in these forms so it's it's not a real new thing which is created 
just like the example it gives of a pot. So from clay, it's not a new thing which has been created called a pot. It is the same clay alone which appears as the pot. It is the same rope, he gave the rope snake example. It's the same rope alone, it's never, it has not become a snake. There is no second thing called a snake. It's mistaken to be a snake. So it's, the rope is not a cause of something called a snake. The clay is not really a cause of something called, uh, 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 come up here and sit, sit somewhere here. Come up, come up. If therefore, God is not really a cause of the jiva or the jagat, these are not separate things, then there is, not, there is no duality. It's not really an effect, so there is no duality. It's not that there's one and then there's two here. Rather, this alone appears as this and this. So, so God is not, there is not a second apart from God. If these are not effects, then can we call God, God a cause? If there are no real effects, can we call the cause a cause? It, it's not really a cause in that sense. What, it is, what is it a cause of? Nothing real. So it's no, not a cause. It's neither cause nor effect. This is one non-dual reality without a second. In terms of Mandukya Upanishad, let us try to understand it. The paradigm which we are following here. We experience the world in, as the waker and the waker's world. If you're thinking, what is that? That's you and the world that you are experiencing. And we experience it as the dreamer and the dream world of dreams, dream world. Each of us, individually, we have our own experiences. And we also have a deep sleep experience. The deep sleeper and the blankness, the potential world of the deep sleep from which has emerged these things. So, let's call, what should we call it? The potential world, let us say. The potential world. So, this is the world this is the jiva, the individual. And, the, and this is not Vedanta, this is not Upanishad, this is what we experience. This is just repeating what we experience, every one of us. What Vedanta is telling us is, the Upanishad tells us is, that there is a fourth, the Turiya, which literally means the fourth. This alone appears as the waker, the dreamer, and the deep sleeper. It's not that the waiter, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper are three things produced from Turiya. It is the Turiya, it's this consciousness, consciousness with a capital C, which, which is experienced as a waker, dreamer, and deep sleeper. When is the waker available? In the state of waking. When is the dreamer available? When we dream. When do you find out the deep sleeper in our deep sleep? And it is this Turiya alone, it is this Turiya alone, which appears as the waker's world, as the dreamer's world, as the deep sleep world. It is the Turiya, which is experienced as you the waker and the world that you are experiencing. Really speaking, you are none other than, you the waker are none other than Turiya. And this world which you are experiencing is an appearance, an experience in Turiya. It has no separate reality. In the classic Vedantic statement, Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya, Jiva Brahmaivana Para. Brahman alone is real. The world is an appearance and you are none other than the absolute. You are, you are Brahman. How, do you, how will you put it here? Turiya Satyam. Satyam. This is the truth. Turiya. And this world. What is world according to Mandukya Upanishad? Waker's world, dreamer's world and deep sleep. Blankness. This is an appearance. Mithya. And you. What are you in this? Uh, you are the waker, dreamer and deep sleeper in different states. This waker, dreamer, deep sleeper is none other than Turiya. Therefore, the Turiya is, is not an effect. If it had really produced a world, it would have been an effect. The Turiya is not an effect. The Turiya, if it's not an effect, it's not even a cause. 
So in this chapter, what he has been doing is Gaudapada. First of all, he proved, you remember the example of sky and pot, which he used to prove that the waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, the individual being, the jiva, is not a separate new reality. We are the absolute, right now, always where. It just seems different. And the world is now, in that, this section which is going on now, is showing that the world also is an appearance in Brahman. It's not a separate uh, reality out there. So Brahman or Turiya, or pure consciousness, or pure being, whichever way you put it, is neither cause nor effect, and hence non-dual. Where is samsara, the world of problems? Here. This, this is samsara. Our samsara, what we call, hey, this is, we are in samsara. Waker and waker's world. In dream also samsara is there. Nightmare. Good dream, bad dream. But there's also samsara. Deep sleep. What do you think? No. Yet, seed farm. Seed farm. It, it will come back. It's not there. It's not experienced. You don't experience any trouble in deep sleep. But it's there. It comes back. When you wake up, it comes back. When I'm out of body, where am I? Between, the, between Turiya and the other three? Out of body experiences, uh, if you have an experience like that, that would be in a waking state. If you have an extraordinary experience, you're awake. And other people are awake. Right now, if you get an out of body experience, you feel you are floating up to the ceiling. Don't do that. But if you were floating, it would be in the waking state. If you get a similar experience in your dreams, it would be in the dream state. Notice, out of body experiences, coma, samadhi, uh, mystic experiences, extraordinary states, pathological states, whatever. If it's a state coming and going, where will it be? Somewhere here. And if you remember the original mantra of the seventh mantra of the Mandukya, they had in-between states also. Waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, something in between. Uh, so whatever you can talk about, if it's a state, a state means which comes and goes. A state means where you are an experiencer and you experience something. So out of body experience, not, a, not the, exam, uh, the word, it's an experience. Uh, so it must be an experience in consciousness. Can you have experience without consciousness? No. So again it points back to Turiya. Another example we used was gold and ornaments. So you have uh, maybe a bracelet or a necklace or a tiara and they're all made of gold. And the reality of those ornaments is gold. It is gold alone which appears as the bracelet, necklace or tiara. In and through them there is only gold. There's nothing other than that. Okay. So this is how he tries to establish non-duality. Um, Remember, hold on to the questions. Remember, though the world and the individual experiencing the world, they are said to be not ultimately real, but they have a practical validity. Right now, for example, even if this is, if this is true and if we become enlightened, would this still continue? Yes. What would continue? Name, form and utility would continue. It would still appear the same. It would still use the same descriptions and the same uh, use also would be there. Activity would be there. What I mean by that is, suppose suddenly you see in Tiffany's, you see all the gold ornaments and you realize, oh, it's all gold. After that, after realizing this, would that this realization prevent you from recognizing a necklace as a necklace? Would you suddenly say it was a necklace, but now it's gold? No. You know it's gold and you also know if somebody says that's a necklace, you know what, what that person means. Would it prevent you from using the necklace properly that you know the necklace is supposed to be put here? But would you, would you say that, oh, I now I know that it's all gold. I can put the necklace here. I can put the tiara on my on ne <laughs> ear. Would you say that? No. You know the proper use. You know the proper use. And after enlightenment also. So what, do I, what I mean by that is, after enlightenment also, you can be for perfectly functional in this world. You'd be more functional. You'd no longer be affected by the vicissitudes of samsara, the ups and downs, the fears and anxieties of samsara. You would not be affected. You would uh, be safe from the shocks of, of samsara. It's as somebody joked that before enlightenment, you say, what? And after enlightenment, so what? 
So it was a nice, I, had, I can't take credit for it, but Swami said it. So enlightenment, he says, journey from what to so what? Shocks come in life, what? People behave badly with me, illness comes, I have failure, what? And if you look at it from this point of view, so what? It's the same thing. You are absolutely all right, perfectly all right. But practical use continues. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm just struggling a little bit sometimes with terminology. Since hmm. I also go to a spiritist center. So would Torya be the equivalent to an eternal spirit? Or it goes beyond us being eternal spirits? It is not an eternal spirit. It is the eternal spirit. The one. The one. Yeah. So no longer individualized. We must There's no individualization. It is the ultimate reality. It is what appears as individuals. You know, the terminology in Vedanta, if you leave the Sanskrit out, if you look at the English, it's really very simple. And it has the advantage of, of cleaving closely to our daily experience. You don't have to learn weird new terminology like astral bodies or out of body experiences. You just have to know what we all experience, all the time. That's all that's necessary. Who does not know the waker? Waker means you, right now. And the waking experience. Who does not dream? Who has not experienced deep sleep? That's all that is necessary. Who does not even understand consciousness in, in, in a sense that you are feeling aware right now? Yes, this absolute consciousness is the thing that Vedanta wants to teach and is trying to educate us, trying to point it out to us. It's also there, right now. That's all that is necessary. I can't think of a more simple uh, terminology. It's much easier. Instead of trying to match this to some other terminology, it's best to accept or, or understand this terminology and uh, then evaluate other terminologies in the, this, this way. What, the way I approach any philosophy is, can I relate it to my personal experience? Is it relatable? Now, some philosophers might say, there are these extraordinary things, you can't experience it now, but it is possible for some great mistakes, some, if you go to certain planes of experience, I will have to just, what is called, bracket it out and say that, possible. I'm not denying it, but it's not within my experience, and it's not within common experience. It is treated as highly suspicious by any rational scientific mind, but it's possible. It's possible. How can I say it's not possible? There are extraordinary, you know, extrasensory powers. Patanjali Yoga Sutra speaks about so many things. Certainly. And in the lives of mystics, we find so many accounts. Am I going to believe, disbelieve all of that? No, no, no. But I leave it as a possibility. Vedanta says, not important. Vedanta says, not important. Vedanta says, what you experience in this world is still samsara. It's still the world itself. Whether it's religion, whether it's science, whatever it is, it's still samsara. Vedanta is asking, what is it that is experiencing it? What are you? A very simple pushback, turn it around. What are you? I'm an astral body, but the astral body, is it a thing? Which is, it's a body, right? So it must be in samsara. What experiences the astral body? Yeah. No, the experiences are important. Okay. And just leave it there. Vedanta, Vedanta he asks a simple question. To whom or what is this experience happening? Is it an experience? You'll say yes. Have you seen it? You say yes. In that case, not important. What is important is the seer. Is you. Vedanta will say, I'm not interested in your experiences, but I'm interested in you. Why am I not interested in experiences? Experiences come and go. Experiences individual. You have it, I don't have it. They come and go. They are good and bad. They are limited. But I am asking, who is it that is experiencing it? Yes. Yeah, but my struggle is, is it okay to have it as part of the spiritual practice? Of course, of and course. Certainly. Because other than Advaita Vedanta, everything else is what you are talking about. The path of yoga, path of bhakti. Um, path of um, karma, meditation, all those practices, they are dealing with experiences. Yeah, but I feel like I hear then your voice in my ear saying it's irrelevant, it's not important. 
Great. But, but just, just hold on to this. Hold on to this. Because in that, in, in that case, you know, I also don't follow what I'm saying. So I also, I, I give importance to experiences. So it's not wrong what you're doing. But remember, here we are studying Advaita Vedanta. In this, within this, you learn a thing in its own terms. So when I, the way I approach anything is, I try to learn it in my own term, uh, in, in, in the terms in which it is taught. When I go to a physics class, for example, I will not say, oh, you're talking about objects, they're all appearances. No, that's not relevant. If, I, if I'm going to learn cooking, I will say, if I say, no, 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 it's, uh, it's neither cause nor effect, nor fire, nor the pot, nor the uh, uh, rice is real. No, 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 it's not relevant. It's not relevant. Yeah. 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 I'll take you home with me. Your voice in my ear. Very good. <laughs> yeah, but look, you're putting a lot of things but, but, <laughs> but, but remember, but remember, I'll give you one way of resolving the conflict. One way. The way I resolve it. Okay. Remember, the Swami also meditates, Swami also sings bhajan, Swami is also interested in meditation and experiences of meditation. I'm interested in all that also. Just not in this class. Then you say that how how can you not how can you be the same person and have these two same this way this is the way I keep this as the foundation and that as the superstructure on that that's important that's very good you are in the world so you will experience the world and spiritual experience is the best part of experiencing the world right. <laughs> it is true from this point of view it's not important. And, 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 and that's good, and that's good. It's like what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, suppose you go to a movie hall, and you get, get very entangled with the movie. I'll tell you it's not important, let it go, it's a movie. Did I tell you not to watch movies? No. Enjoy all the movies you like. Be delighted with it, but know it's a movie. What is real is you. Similarly, worldly experiences, yogic experiences, spirit experiences, whatever you call them, I cannot deny that they are there. It would be foolish to deny. They are there. But Advaita is something, you're here talking, you're talking about the peak of the Mount Everest. From the ultimate point of view, what is real? There's an absolute reality. Of which everything else is a manifestation. In the world of manifestation, in the world of movies, enjoy the movie. You can enjoy the movie only if you know the reality behind the movie. Otherwise you're caught. Your conflict is, you're trying to live in two worlds, the world of the movie and the real world at the same time. If you make the difference, it, then you will see it's not two worlds. Otherwise, you end up being a schizophrenic. This is one reality, that's another reality. No, there's one reality of which the other is an appearance. Yeah. But it's not a, a, a light problem. We'll see. Gaudapada will bring it up here. He will, in fact, bring up. What is the relationship of these teachings with the dualistic religions? He will talk about it now. I'll come to you. There was another hand. So it would be fair to say, and I know I've asked you this question, and you and me answers in relation to her question. We are not at the peak. You are describing the peak to us. Right. We're understanding the peak, we are making, we are trying to get to the peak. Right. But while we get to the peak, we are still living in the world. True. And so all these practices are ways for us to get to the peak. True. Correct. Right? And, so and that's exactly what Gaurabhad is that's going to say. To your life. Otherwise, you have got no hope. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Gaurabhad is going to say. That, but remember one thing. Again, I will, because it's a Mandukya class, I will say, you are at the peak. You are the peak. You are actually not, you, you get the feeling that I'm trying to grasp something, but theoretically at least take it that Advaita says you are the peak. You are already there, you just have to <laughs> realize it. Yes. Um, and certainly all these practices are useful. I have never said the practices are not useful. Gaurapada would box my ears if I ever say that. He's going to say exactly right, that right now. That all the practices are useful. Why not? It's exactly what I'm saying. If you realize all the ornaments are gold, does it prevent you from putting the tiara on your head and the and necklace on your neck and the bracelet on your wrist? It doesn't prevent you. But you know they are all the same reality. That's, a, that's, what, that's what it's. It doesn't prevent. That's the point I'm making. There is a relative reality. The rel reality you're talking about. The reality at, at the level of which we practice so many things, worldly and religious. Yeah. The reality at the level of which we are theist, atheist, whatever. It's there. That's the relative reality. 
That's what Vedanta is saying. That's all. So then after enlightenment, what will happen? Even after enlightenment, the relative reality will continue to appear. You will continue to see the differences. And you will continue to be, you have full use of everything. Except that you know, now know that the background is one reality. Now supposing after enlightenment, these differences still appear. What to say that before enlightenment, you must use these differences and acknowledge these differences. Even a dream. Um, if you're thirsty in a dream, you may have a nice bottle of water next to your bed. It will not help you in the dream. Only your dream water will help you in the dream. Uh. In waking up, you had a bottle of water in your dream, wake up and feel thirsty. You have to use the bottle next to your bed, the, the water in the waking state. Uh, so, at each level, whatever is appearing, that is... Uh, relatively real at that level and that relative reality becomes clear after enlightenment till that point one certainly must go on um, using whatever is given by the world morality religion science everything is validity yeah Shamji, I, I believe in Adultabad, but I as a believer I believe pure consciousness in that case, even the project we are unreal in a sense living world, I can accept very well to grasp, try to pure conscious mind to examine the facts in order to cross over the battle. Am I allowed? Because certainly, if and if remember, I, in Bhatt, I have to grasp the ability to cross the battle or the living because even it is unreal because living in a living world I can take the gift from there certainly. as much as I can certainly after enlightenment also does the non-dualist give up all these techniques no no the non-dualist mas masters who if they find the mind is a little disturbed they immediately use Patanjali yoga to calm the mind down if they find that they go to a wonderful temple where there is a presence of God in a very dualistic way they enjoy it fully yeah. We'll talk about it now. Then what is the difference between a dualist and non-dualist? That also will become clear now. So you are allowed to use all techniques. You must. What do you mean allowed? Do you not eat when you are hungry? You, you can eat, hold a job, drive a car. All practical uses there. What, what harm has religion done? So that also you are allowed to do. And not only allowed, those are extremely useful. Otherwise one does not come up to that. But then what is the uniqueness about it? If all of this is exactly what it is in the dualistic world, then what is special about non-dualism? We will see. Even at this point, suppose you say, I am not yet enlightened. I don't have that realization. What will learning non-dualism do for me? You will see. He is going to talk about it. He is now going to compare non-dualism with dualistic religions. Let us go to verse number 17. So from 17 to I think 22, what is the topic going on? That Brahman is, Turiya is non-dual and these are all appearances and that's going on. But from 17 to 22, what will happen is, um, he will take a little diversion and talk about the dualistic religions. From a non-dual perspective on the dualistic religions, the uh, dualistic philosophies at that time, but very relevant to what is, uh, what is happening here also right now. 17. Swasiddhanta vyavasthasu Swasiddhanta vyavasthasu Dvaiti no nishchita dridham Dvaiti no nishchita dridham Parasparam virudhyante Parasparam virudhyante Tairayam na virudhyate the dualistic philosophies and religions, worldviews, have specific worldviews, philosophies, and they are fully set in them. They are fully convinced and set in those. And those have different worldviews and they conflict with each other. But this non dualistic worldview has no conflict with the with any of the dualistic worldviews. What is he saying? The dualistic philosophies, worldviews, religions, here he means philosophies, dualistic worldviews or philosophies are different from each other. Note one thing, there are many of those. 
there cannot be many non-dualisms. It is very interesting that when you come through Shankara Advaita in Hinduism and Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka Buddhism, which is non-dual in certain sense, they begin to sound extraordinarily similar. So, non-dualism tends to become the same. You will note non-dualistic realizations of Islamic mystics, of Christian mystics, Jewish Kabbalah, you know, um, mystics, and Advaita Vedanta, and the Buddhist, they all sound similar. At least if you read, unbiased way, just read the accounts, they sound almost literally the same. When um, uh, the uh, Sufi says that, um, that I am one with Allah, uh, when um, Anal Haq, I am one with, with the Lord, I am the Lord, I am that. When, the, when somebody like Meister Eckhart says, uh, the ground of my soul and the ground of God are one and the same thing. He is transcending individual and God. When the Taoist says that before the worlds were created there was uh, one, uh, one source, which is still there right now. So you see the same kind of language everywhere, Tattva Masi, that thou art. But in dualistic religions, they are very different from each other. And uh, they are not only different, they are in conflict with each other. Whereas this non-dual approach has no conflict with the dualistic religions. So what does it mean? Very simply, non-dualism sets up multiple levels of reality. So ultimate reality is this, pure consciousness. There is a relative reality, a lower degree of reality. In Sanskrit it is called Vyavaharika, transactional. Right now, if you think what is that transactional reality, the one which we are inhabiting right now. Right now we think this is the only reality. But Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta tells us there is a deeper or a higher reality, which is Brahman, the Absolute. And this is a lower reality, Vyavaharika. What basically the non-dualist has done is, is relegated all these religions to the Vyavaharika. At the level of the transactional reality, there is a God, there is a world, there you are, and it's true. It's true. Those things are true. Science is true. Religion is true in its own way. And uh, the different religions, dualistic religions, are basically talking about the same thing in different language. Uh, truth is one, the sages call it variously. So this is what it has done. Um, let's go into a little more detail. The commentator here says, by the way, what does he mean by dualists here? Who, are, who is he talking about? Shankaracharya may, uh, explains. Kapila Kanada Buddha Arhatadi Dvaitinaha. So, he has just mentioned Kapila is the founder of the Sankhya system. Uh, Kanada is the founder of the Vaisheshika system. These are ancient schools of Hindu philosophy. They are all dualistic. Um, then... Uh, the Buddhist systems, he says, they are also dualistic. I mean, it's not entirely true. There are Buddhist schools which are non-dualistic. And the Jaina system, Arhat means the Jaina system, etc., he says. But today it would mean just about every no, uh, dualistic religion. Uh, the various Vaishnava schools, the Shaiva schools, the Shakta schools within Hinduism, um, the various schools of, uh, uh, of uh, or very various denominations of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all the religions of the, basically the theistic religions of the world, they are dualistic. Uh, the non-theistic ones also, like Jainism, they are also dualistic. So this is, it applies what he is saying. So two points here. One is, their view of the world, their world views differ. So Gaudapada, the, the, the commentator Shankaracharya says, they all are affected by this def defect of Raga Dvesha, likes and dislikes. So I have a worldview. It's born from my culture, my religion, my tradition, and I like this. And I consider everything else to be lower or false. Or I've converted into this. If I've converted into this, I bought into it because I think it's real. It's, it's, it, it's good. And therefore everything else is uh, less or inferior. Raga, it's inevitable. Something like God excites the highest and the worst passions. 
so which can exalt you to great uh, um, worship and love and devotion can also generate hatred for others. So these dualistic religions have this problem. I consider that my way of thinking, whether Vishnu or Allah or uh, my traditions, this is correct. This is right. The others are either false or they are inferior. The ways that they were treated was um, the newer religions. Newer, by newer I mean religions like Christianity or Islam or in the Indian context Buddhism or uh, later on other religions. They convert. It is natural because if you are a new religion and there is already an older religion, where will you get your followers until you can, unless you convert? <laughs> so these religions are always converting religions. Whether it is Islam or Christianity or Buddhism for example, they are converting religions. Uh, Sikhism for example. So they accept converts from others. And so it becomes a great thing to convert our pe pe other people to my way of thought. It is not that the older religions are, are um, um, exempt or free of being bigoted um, or prejudiced against others. The older religions have a different kind of uh, bigotry. Like you are excluded. So Hinduism, Judaism for example, um, they, they are the older religions. Zoroastrianism. Notice they have certain things similar. For example, the Zoroastrians, the Parsis in India, the Zoroastrians, and the, in the Jewish families, in more orthodox ones, if you marry a non-Jewish person, a non-Zoroastrian person, then immediately your family becomes non-Zoroastrian or non-Jewish. Uh, so the older religions were like that. They, they, didn't, they did not convert and they excluded. They tended to exclude. But that's also a kind of narrowness, uh, exclusion. One kind of fanaticism is, I am right, you are wrong and you better come and join me, otherwise I am going to cut off your head. That is a kind of fanaticism. You see it is in some of the uh, missionary religions. The other kind of narrowness you find in say old Hinduism for example. I am right or superior, you are not wrong but you are far inferior, do not touch me. <laughs> Stay away from me. You are going to pollute me if you do. So there are a kind of exclusionary kind of thing. So there are there's narrowness in both cases. The saving grace compared to say Islam or Christianity in Hinduism is that the, when the Swami Vivekananda put it, he said in this country that uh, when you become fanatical you tend to torture others. The, when the Hindu becomes fanatical he tor tortures himself. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Harris, he makes a point that it is not true that all fundamentalisms are bad. Then he point, points out there is a religion in India called Jainism whose fun central teaching is non-violence. So he says the more fanatical a Jain becomes, the more safe you are. Because <laughs> <coughs> the less likely he's go he or she is going to in indulge in any kind of violence. So it's, it's what, you are fundamental, what you are fundamentalist about that is dangerous. So, it's, um, um, so yes, so here is the problem of, of dualistic religions. Parasparam virudhyante, they come in, they clash with each other. It could be in the form of, um, here is the right path. Bring everybody, one and all, to this path. If you resist, so much the worse for you. Um, and when, I, when I, I kill you for bringing you to my path, I am doing you good. Because I would save you from a horrible hell of going in the wrong path. And So at least I have killed you. So that I that, have that done you a service. So this kind, it leads to straight to enormous violence. And it has done, done so. When I feel I am right for something as important as religion, uh, it sort of enables a person, sort of, um, uh, sort of permits violence. And many uh, wars in history, until the modern time, most many wars, not all, but many wars were fought for religion. And think about it, how strange. All the religions, without exception, preach goodness. Morality, and they all have some version of the golden rule. The golden rule, which is there in the United Nations, you know, mm -hmm. to treat others as you would have them treat you. They all have it, and they're all good. They're all meant for uplifting humanity. But how is it that religion became an uh, an instrument of war, an instrument of terror, an instrument of oppression, uh, subjugation? One reason is politics, of course. It gets tied with politics. So Gaudapada says, non-dualist approach is safe from that. That's a claim he makes. Now, no, uh, hold on to the question. 
Why? It's very difficult to imagine um, uh, blowing up people in the name of the non-dual Brahman. <laughs> <laughs> that is ridiculous. Why would you do that? It's literally the one you're blowing up and, and you, the one who's, who is being blown up. You're one and the same. It does not matter what, what philosophy they hold on to. Any kind of dualistic uh, philosophy that they hold on to is perfectly alright with the non-dualist. It does not clash with the non-dualist. Which, which gold jewel crash, uh, ornament clashes with gold? A thing, same gold can either be a tiara or it can be a necklace. So ne necklace and tiara clash because they are, one cannot be both. But gold can be both. If, when it is a tiara, it's perfectly alright being a tiara. When it's a necklace, it's perfectly alright being a necklace. It has no conflict with either. Because it's talking about a more fundamental level of reality. Can a non-dualist be a fanatic? In one sense. Not in the sense of converting people or being violent or fighting wars. Somebody said another interesting thing. In the, no, in, in the impersonal, politics is not possible. A brahmachari long ago in... Um, a training center in the monastery, we were discussing this. He said, politics is personal. In the impersonal, there is no politics. So it's very difficult to do politics in science. It's very difficult to have Hindu science and Buddhist science and uh, Christian science. No, it's an impersonal truth. How can you have mathematics uh, of, a, of a nation or a religion? You can't. It's an impersonal truth. You can't do politics with it. Similarly, this Advaita Vedanta is an impersonal reality. But the beauty of it is, it does not deny the person. It relegates the person to yes. transactional reality here. So all persons, we are all permitted. Gold does not deny ornaments. In fact, gold enables the ornaments to exist and shine. Similarly, this Brahman alone enables all of us to be here and to shine, to express ourselves. It alone appears as the world. So it has no conflict with the world or with individual beings and no conflict with our various philosophies. So he says all these philosophies and religions, they fight with each other, parasparam virudhyante, inevitably so, because they are making different claims about the same thing. But we have no conflict with any of them. Now, is it possible, I'll come to your question, is it possible for a non-dualist to be fanatical? In a different sense. Not in a political sense, not in a violent sense, but in a sense of being dismissive and contemptuous. So, for example, Totapuri. The moment you begin to like and understand non-dualism, immediately you feel you have been elevated to an elite. That's a dangerous feeling. So, Totapuri, Sri Ramakrishna's guru in Advaita Vedanta. How does he react when Sri Ramakrishna claps and takes the name of God? Sri Ramakrishna had the habit at the sunset around this time, as he had a way of thinking, um, you know, if you cannot count the individual hairs in your hand, it's so dark, it's time to clap and take the name of God. So like a child, he would sit and uh, Rama, Rama, Hare, Hare, Krishna, Krishna, and Kali, Kali, like that he would do. Totapur, he was talking, I'm sure, about Manduki or something like that. If you start doing that, I would be aghast too. <laughs> <laughs> Totapuri stares at him and says, whatever are you doing? And he says, Chapati Banari, are you making Chapati? In the villages of North India, in the evening, the ladies will sit like that and uh, uh, in front of the fire and take the that the flat dough and do this on the fire and bake the bread, the chapati. One uh, Dutch Swami in India, he had given a name for the chapati. He would call them UFOs, <laughs> unidentified flat objects. <laughs> that was standard food there. So, in our ashram, he would call them UFOs. Are you? Are you baking chapati? Because the women do this way. So you are singing the name of God. It's, and he's, he's a... Uh, uh, Sri Ramakrishna is... Uh, uh, you know, he is uh, taken aback. I am taking the name of God and you are saying I am baking ch ch chapatis. Uh, look at this. That's contempt. When Sri Ramakrishna says, I will go and ask my mother. Tudapur says, you want to learn non-dualism? I see you are fit for non-dualism. You want to learn it? He says, I have to ask my mother, because he would ask the Divine Mother for everything in the temple in Kali. And Todapuri thought he meant his own mother. 
and he races off to the temple and comes back and says, Mother says that you have been sent to teach me that, so I'll, I'll learn from you. But Todabri didn't like it one bit until he learned different. But this is the problem with non-dualism. So that kind of fanaticism might be there. A, a scientist, I'll come to you, a scientist once told me he felt very hurt. He went to a great teacher of non-dualism in modern India who has passed away recently. He was a, really a great master of non-dualism. And the scientist, he was so shocked, he came and told me that I went and told the Swami that, uh, that I am a physicist. And the Swami said, physics, oh science, that's all Maya, <laughs> let it go. <laughs> he's not being fanatical. He can absolutely logically demonstrate that he's absolutely right. And in a sense, he is right. But it's not a helpful way of reacting. If you dismiss all that, what's the poor scientist going to do? <laughs> so does everybody have to become a non-dualist monk in the living in the Himalayas? No. <clears throat> and that's not what Krishna taught or the Upanishads teach. That's not that. So that's a um, way of dealing with it. It can happen like that. Question. So um, just to set up a, a, a stage where an atheist comes um, and a very hardcore uh, dual, dualist comes to a non-dual, hmm. both of them say, you you don't contradict with my philosophy. Hmm. But the atheist says, I don't believe in God, there is no God. Yeah. The dualist says, of course there is God. Hmm. God is everywhere. Hmm. How does a new non-dualist respond satisfying both and still not be not contradicting? Oh, you won't satisfy both. As a non-dualist, I have a place for the scientist and for the atheist and the theist. Whether the atheist and the theist will accept my position, that is <laughs> different. They will not. The problem with the theist is non-dualism is terrifying for the theist. The non-dualist has a place for the theist. It will come in the next verse. That we have a place for the dualist. But the dualist has no place for us. I can accommodate God is an appearance in this world. You can, you can accommodate God in the non-dualist framework at the level of Vyavaharika reality. But what will a theist, remaining a theist, if he becomes a non-dualist, well and good. Then you say you sign him up for the Mandukya class. <laughs> but remaining a theist, I believe only in my Shiva or my Krishna or my Christ and nothing else. The rest is all superstition or whatever or is bad. Now, how will the non-dualism impact this person? He cannot absorb it. I can put him here. But where will he put me? He has to say, the dualist, committed dualist, the narrow dualist has to say non-dualism is false. Has to say non-dualism is dangerous and harmful. And that's exactly what they took. The um, ancient, there are schools of Vaishnavism in Hinduism who are deeply against uh, non-dualism. They, uh, I, I they, they call us Mayavadis. So they, they, they hate each other, the dualist schools. But they are dualist schools. When you ask them about non-dualism, we are like we are the worst of the worst. We are far worse than the other dualists. Because something can be made of them. But we are absolutely... <laughs> so they are Mayavadis, the, the teacher of the doctrine of Maya, of illusion. And uh, for example... Uh, in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, there are two schools of Mayavada which are hated most. One is us and the other one is the Buddhists. <laughs> they can't absorb it. It's, it's impossible. It's devastating for, for their worldview. Uh, say, I, I mean, a, a committed uh, uh, Iskwan, uh, Hare Krishna follower and a Christian evangelist can go at it. They almost are like mirror images. I had arguments with both types and I found that if you replace Krishna with Christ, their arguments are more or less the same. They are like mirror images. But what they can't handle is this kind of an approach. Yeah. So that's the thing. Yes? Just as a thought experiment, uh, if there is an enlightened person, a Jivan Mukti, hmm. for example, and, is con and he or she is confronted with either evil or injustice, what is the reaction of that person? Is it is it to say that this is just an appearance and doesn't matter at the end at all, so I'm, I'm just going to watch it, I guess. True. Or, in, in, or, or does the person say, I'm now in the world, so I have to 
world of time and cause and, and effect and all yeah. that. And I therefore have to plunge in and try to correct this. Both are true. Notice, it does not matter in the end, it's perfectly all right, I'm going to watch it. Which is, it is true from which point of view? This point of view. And this is the fundamental point of view of an enlightened person. So that person knows. But that person also has a body and a life and a limited existence in this world. And so the person would try his or her best to overcome suffering. I mean, such persons usually have a tremendous sympathy for everybody. Notice the lives of these persons, whether it's Ramana Maharshi living in a cave or the Buddha teaching till the age of 80 in the dusty north plains of North India 2500 years ago or the great masters Ramakrishna or Christ helping people till the last breath of their lives. Now they have two things. One is Sri Ramakrishna afflicted by cancer till almost the, the last day of his life he is helping people, giving initiation, giving teaching. Anybody who comes he feels are people coming? Let, 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 me, let, let them come. I will tell them about God and help them in their life, take them out of suffering. So at that level, he is giving up his life, literally, for the welfare of others. That's what a, a, a person who feels the oneness of existence will do. So many people are suffering. If this one body is to be exhausted in the service of others, Vivekananda says, I would give a thousand lives if I can, you can lift even a dog out of its misery. So that kind of tremendous sympathy he has. How? Because from that point of view, this person sees everybody as one. Not as a dream. I am in all these beings who are suffering. And I feel very keenly the suffering of others. At the same time, from this point of view, as far as he is concerned, he knows it's perfectly alright. It's nothing, no, nothing wrong. Even in the body's dying of cancer, or put on a cross and uh, bleeding to death, the spirit is undisturbed. They know that the reality is completely undisturbed. Yeah. So this is the attitude. And you can actually check this. When Sri Ramakrishna says that uh, I am suffering from cancer. Is he not suffering? Is he playing? Is he saying it's a dream? No, no, no. He feels the same pain that a cancer patient would feel. I can't eat. I am um, weak. It hurts. And then when Hari Maharaj, uh, Hari tells him that. Uh, but I see that you are in great bliss. A cancer patient. That's cruel to say to a cancer patient. He bursts out laughing and says, oh, the rascal has found me out. <laughs> How? Found out what? That this is not touched by the cancer here. You, the watcher of the movie, are not touched by the patient dying of cancer so um, tragically on screen. You will just see that and say, bravo. Not for others, for in your own case. Uh, so, yes. Uh, let me go ahead. A little philosophical angle on this. Why do the dualists conflict with each other, they are bound to be in conflict with each other and why the non-dualist has no conflict. This is how we experience the world. I mentioned it yesterday in the um, gospel class. Do you remember the knower? In Sanskrit, pramata. Knowledge or source of knowledge. In Sanskrit, Pramana. And knowable, the universe. In Sanskrit, Prameya. Knower, source of knowledge and things to be known. Very simple. Here is a pen. It's a knowable. You are a knower and you've got eyes. Eyes are the source of knowledge for you. You the knower, using your eyes, you see the object, the knowable. This is the knowable, Prameya. You are the knower, Pramata. And the instrument of knowledge you deploy to know this is called Pramana. Okay. And these sources of knowledge are many. There are many pramatas, many sources of knowledge and many knowables. It's basically a description, what you might call an epistemological description of the universe we are in right now. Now the problem is, because the sources of knowledge are many, depending on what you use, you will see the world differently. A person, you are seeing the world, you have a particular vision of the world. 
Suppose you don't. Come, 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 sit, sit. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can come and sit here. Yeah. Suppose somebody only hears, has the sense of sound, not, not vision. The way you will describe the world and the way that person will describe the world will be very different. That person describes the world as sensations and sounds. And you describe the world as colors and shapes. And you will conflict because your way of looking at the reality and his way of looking at the reality, both based on sources of knowledge, yet they differ radically. So that's all right. We understand that. But what about religion? Now, con depending on what you consider to be a source of knowledge about God and the world and the meaning of life, whether it is the Bible or the Quran or the Torah or the Gita or the Vedas, you will tend to look at it through that. And your worldview of what is real, what is, the, what is God, is God with form or without form, is God male or female or with or beyond gender, um, is God one with you or different from you, is there God at all? It all depends upon your source of knowledge, what you have accepted as a uh, reliable source of knowledge. Okay with me so far? So these people, they will differ from each other and they're bound to clash, they're bound to differ and from differing there will be clashes. But then how does non-duality get beyond this? What non-duality says is, these three, technically these three are called Triputi. Triputi, there's a word. Triputi means the triple, what shall I say? The triple points of um, epistemology, epistemological, um, um, let us say, um, loci or epistemological basis. Epistemology means the knowledge, the study of how we get knowledge. What Vedanta says, all three are appearing in one consciousness. Ultimately, neither the knower nor the pramana nor the knowable are ultimately real. They are all appearances in one reality, which you are. So, all of these are acceptable. Why? First, because they are not the ultimate reality. Second, they are all coming from you, that, that one reality. And all of these other people, whatever they say, they are actually this one. It's not that the non-dualist alone is Advaita, is, is, is Brahman. Everybody, whether they agree to non-dualism or not. Uh, whether they are theist, atheist, dualist, non-dualist, scientist, skeptics, whatever they are. From the non-dual point of view, you are all as much Brahman as I am or Sri Ramakrishna is or anybody. It, it is absolutely the same reality. Because from this point of view, all of these are acceptable. There is no conflict. You, anyone will do. And what we just discussed earlier, they are all beneficial. All the different moral and spiritual practices, they are good for somebody somewhere. They are all meant to elevate persons. Advaita will re regard them as uh, steps or preparations for the highest knowledge. So they are good. If somebody does not want the dualistic religions of the world, can an, but an atheist can also come to Advaita. The atheist, who is an atheist? An atheist somebody like say Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens deploying the sources of knowledge called science comes to the conclusion there cannot be anything called God. Fine, that's also all right. And yet that does not prevent that person from understanding non-dualism if he wants to. So all these practices are good. Now moving on. Today I had an interesting experience. I had gone to an interfaith conference organized in Greenwich High School. 600 kids, they're all grade 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, what is it called? Um, freshman, sophomore, junior and senior, yeah. So, the, 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 so about 600, 650 kids were there for one hour long program. There was a pastor and a rabbi and a swami. It sounds like a joke. The pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and a, a Muslim uh, representative from the UN was a Muslim uh, preacher. Uh, so, they were, that makes how many, four or five of us, four of us. So, and, and the guy at the entrance, the security guy at the entrance, he was, he was humorous. He said, so Swami, are you with the pastor and the rabbi or are you one with yourself? <laughs> <laughs> you got it right. <laughs> are you one with yourself? And they ask interesting questions. One um, student asked, 
If somebody laughs at my religion, what do I do? And things, questions like that. Where does all this come from? It comes from these clashes between dualistic religions. Verse number 18. So, how does Advaita avoid all this? And why is Dvaita bound to be caught in this problem? How, why does non-dualism avoid these problems? And dualism bound to be caught up in these problems? Advaitam paramartho hi Advaitam paramartho hi Dvaitam tadbheda uchyate Dvaitam tadbheda uchyate Tesham ubhayata dvaitam Tesham ubhayata dvaitam Tenayam na virudhyate Tenayam na virudhyate so it says, non-dualism is the absolute reality. And dualism is a manifestation of the, all not dual philosoph dualist philosophies are manifestations of the non-dual reality. So dualist philosophies are all at the transactional plane, at the relative plane. This difference applies in non-dualism alone. But for dualism, he says, Tesham ubhayatha dvaitam. Here is an interesting distinction. The distinction between a higher truth and a lower truth, the absolute and the relative, this distinction does not apply in dualistic religions. If you ask a Vaishnava or a Shaiva or a Muslim or a Christian or, 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 the, or the Jew, what is the absolute reality according to you and what is the relative reality? There is no absolute and relative. There is one reality only. They, they collapse the two. What happens is, so for the dualist, this world is also dualistic and liberation, ultimately what they, whatever liberation is, that's also dualistic. So here I am in this world, a suffering person, if I'm a Hindu, I say I'm caught in karma, my own karma, being born, condemned to being born again and again. If I'm a Christian, I say I'm condemned by my own original sin and I'm trapped in this dualistic. Gaudapada would say this is a dualistic world. There is a God and there is the suffering individual and there is the world. Now, what would be freedom from this? What would be my desired state? What does my religion promise me? The Christian heaven or the Islamic heaven or the Vaishnava, the Hinduism, the multiple uh, conceptions of heaven, you know, Kailasha or uh, Vaikuntha or Goloka, whatever you call it. Now, I can say from the dualistic point of view, they talk about going there, being free of the suffering of this world, Maybe a Christian would say that my original sin is redeemed. I am restored to my pristine perfection as Adam was or Eve was in the garden of paradise. And I live in the presence of God. A holy blissful existence. I am there. Other blessed souls are there. God is there. That's a pretty good description of a Christian heaven or, a, or a, an Islamic heaven. And similarly in Hinduism also. The dualistic schools. They talk about multiple kinds of liberation. But all of them are dualistic. What are the kinds of liberation they talk about? They talk about um, Salokya, Samipya, Sayudya, Sarupya. Uh, Salokya means you live in the same realm as God. Not near God, not in the same neighborhood. That's a pricey neighborhood. But you sort of live in a slightly low, lower end uh, part of the town. But it's still heaven. Salokya means the same world or the same realm as God. Even Buddhism has these conceptions. Uh, Buddhism talks about the pure lands and each Buddha creates a pure land. It's a lot like, you know, we talk about Ramakrishna and Ramakrishna Loka, things like that. That's Salokya, you go there, you stay there. And that's also freedom. You are free of suffering in the world. Then there is Samipya, you get to stay near God. So the God you worship, so that's a much better state. You ha get to hang around with the with the big guy himself, is usually himself, um, unless it's Devi Loka in, in Hinduism, where it is she, and all the, where all the cool people hang out. So that means cool people here would be spiritual people. So that is Samipya, nearness. Sarupya, you tend to become more godlike, the form, your, your actual, each of us has a divine body, and so that changes to become more godlike. And Sayujya, you attain to oneness with God. It's not a non dual oneness. 
Uh, you tend to lose your existence and you remain as this creator of the universe. You feel one with it. And you try, try to remain like that. So there are different kinds of liberation, but they are all dualistic. Uh, there also dualism, this difference persists. You are different from other liberated souls. And there are, there is a samsara where there, is, there are a lot of people who are not liberated. There are places like hells where people are suffering. In fact, there is a description of, um, in a medieval Christian text, of how the joys of heaven, if you are a good person and you go to heaven, one of the joys, you won't believe it, one of the joys is looking down from heaven into hell and seeing how those fellows are suffering. What a great joy that is, the suffering of... <laughs> See, I believed in God and I am saved. This fellow did not believe in God. Look how he's suffering. Wow. Thank God. <laughs> so these are all dualistic conceptions. It's there in every dualistic religion. Dualism, the point is, it's there in the world and afterworld, whatever thing you can conceive of, that's also a dualistic conception. Whereas in non-dualism, all these are appearances and that's the um, central truth. You are that non-dual reality right now and it's perfectly alright right now. Um, because they cannot overcome the ultimate duality also, even in moksha, even in freedom. So, they conflict with each other. They cannot absorb Advaita. They cannot, but Advaita can absorb them. Because it, it full play of duality is, is acceptable here. But non-duality ultimately. Of course, the Advaita has, its own, has his own thing he, did, he insists on. The full ultimate realization is the non-dual realization. See, very interesting. Hold on to the question. There was a debate between dualists and a non-dualist in India. There have been many, many, but a recent one. And I read the account written by the non-dualist. He claims victory. But he claims. Nobody declared him the victor. <laughs> what happened was, his name was uh, Kashikanandagiri. He was a great uh, non-dualist teacher. Originally from Kerala, but he settled down in Mumbai. So, uh, he was challenged by a dualist and the debate was held in Bangalore. And uh, the first half went well. The scholars were debating with each other. And they had a particular text from the Gita. A non-dualist interpretation and a dualist interpretation. And they were doing, going at it. Now the supporters who are sitting on two sides, on rows of chairs, they began to get more and more heated. It's the supporters who get heated. <laughs> Uh, and uh, by the time the second session started, the supporters started hurling chairs at each other. <laughs> and the whole debate ended in chaos. <laughs> Anyhow, the non-dualist went back and wrote a book about how he won the debate. <laughs> but there a very interesting point a non-dualist makes. He says, you are talking about <coughs> Krishna, the avatara, and going to Vaikuntha, the heaven after death, devotion to God as Krishna and so on and so forth. At no point do I contradict you. I give you a blank check. Whatever you say is true. From a non-dualist perspective. Then the dualist says, no, no, no. You are saying all of this is an appearance and there is a deeper reality called Brahman. That's what you are saying. That's what I object to. Then the non-dualist puts an interesting question. This deeper reality, what we are talking about, that's our business. You have nothing to say about it because you don't acknowledge any deeper reality. So the reality which you are acknowledging... We acknowledge that too. From a different perspective, we may call it an appearance. But at your level, at the transactional level, exactly what you say. But devotion to Krishna, you can go to heaven and spend an eternity with, with Krishna. Oh, that's a beautiful conception. I am one with it. I, I sign off on it. That flummoxed the dualist because um, this is something both the dualist and the non-dualist has something to say. This is something the dualist has nothing to say about because it's not there in the conceptual map of dualism. So why would you have an objection? It's one way of putting it. Yes. One of the quotes that you said, you said uh, of the dualistic uh, concept. Huh. So what's the exact difference between the third and the fourth? It's just a matter of proportion. S sarupya. Sarupya means you retain your individuality but you become more godlike. You begin to look like Krishna. Whatever that is. And the, not stage, they're all different kinds. And the other one would be you become one with the person of Krishna. It's still a personal God. So how is that different from the moksha? Like when you say this is moksha. This is moksha according to the dualist. So it's one with Krishna. Yeah. So then where is the duality in that? 
There's no duality between you and Krishna. You become one with Krishna. But this duality between Krishna and all others and the world exists and the sinners and saints exist. Everything is going on and you become one with the personality of Krishna. Krishna is not an impersonal existence consciousness place. He is the personal God. Yeah. Yes. I'll come to you. See, that's the problem with non-dualists. <laughs> yeah, I know. And many people, those who begin to appreciate non-dualism, they immediately come up upon this. If this is true, why at all stay with dualism? You might say. And it's true. But the thing is, in, a, in India, it was never the custom of condemning the earlier stages if you go on to something new. All of this was useful to me and is useful to many. How many people will appreciate this? How many of the how people have the intellectual caliber, uh, the um, also certain spiritual maturity is required? Person who holds on to the reality of the world strongly with both arms will find this unacceptable. It's only after, that's why I often say, Vedanta is often a finishing school. In, in uh, California, we had this number of examples who came to Vedanta in the 60s and 70s and drifted away. This school, that school, this, this, this. California has many choices, <laughs> a huge supermarket. And then 20 years later, they come back to Vedanta again. One went out to a very good school of Buddhism and went out the left there. And then he came back. Why? He said, Buddhism is fine. I mean, it gives me everything that Vedanta gives me except God. I miss the old Karmajan. <laughs> I miss the old Karmajan, <laughs> old, old, old Karmajan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This might not be the right place in a Mandukya class, but I want your explanation for two things. One is, Sri Ramakrishna is saying, Akhanda Satchidan and the Krishna, Akhanda Satchidan and the Kali. Mm -hmm. And Madhusudan Saraswati, which is a pure Advaitis, mm -hmm. saying that Krishna Param Sapsana Jan. Mm -hmm. Okay, you? that's a good, good segue. From here, so we understand Gaudapada's point of view. He will, I'll make it more clear what Shankara says, Gaudapada's point of view. But do you think it's very acceptable to be put at, oh, you're all right, you're at the level of appearance. It's a movie. You're okay at the level of a movie. The reality is what I am telling you. You're all all right, but it's fiction. At that level, it's, you're, you're fine. <laughs> Who would agree to that? It's, it's condescending at the, at the least. Um, okay, so what, and in contrast to this, what Sri Ramakrishna says, that we will come to. I, I wanted to make a note about what Sri Ramakrishna says. What is the non-dualist version of harmony? What is the non-dualist version of harmony? Because non-dualist is claiming, we have no conflict. Na virudhyante. We have no conflict with theism, atheism, all the religions of the world, all the philosophies of the world, science. We have no conflict. But what is the nature of this non-conflict? Notice. Shankaracharya explains. He, and in his note to this verse. No, verse number 18. What was the verse number 18? The ultimate reality. Absolute reality is non-duality. And dualism is just a manifestation of that non-duality. For the dualist. This world and the next. All levels of reality are dualism. There is nothing else other than dualism. But we have no conflict with them. Tena ayam na virudhyate. This one does not have any conflict with them. How no conflict? Shankaracharya explains. He says, imagine a person sitting on an elephant going through, a, we're getting many of these elephant stories I think. Um, they're going through a street and um, a madman stands in the street and says, Come on, charge your elephant against mine. We'll ha let's have an elephant fight. Just as this person on the elephant doesn't do anything about it. Just walks past. With what will ha you have an elephant fight? The madman doesn't have an elephant. Therefore, the non-dual philosopher has no conflict with any of the dualists. Because this is the elephant. There's no elephants. They don't have elephants. What, you, what are you going to fight with? Uh, it's like saying a snake or, or a rope. The classic example, a rope, somebody sees it as a snake, mistake. Somebody sees it as um, a piece of a computer cable, maybe in a modern example. Somebody sees it as a trickle of water on the ground. Remember, it's all in semi-darkness. 
So what are the three options? Snake, cable, trickle of water. Suppose three, three options. Now with each other they have conflicts. A cable cannot be a snake. A snake cannot be a trickle of water. They are all different. And they'll fight. No, no, it's a, it's a trickle of water. No, no, be careful. It's a snake. No, it's just a computer cable somebody threw out from the office. They're fighting with each other. The rope has no conflict with any of them. It's because of the rope the three things are perceived or misperceived. They fight with each other. The reality of all of them is the rope. So this is the way they put it. So let me just, yeah, I'll come to you. And that is all right from a non-dualist perspective, but from a dualist perspective, it's, it's insulting. It's plain, plain insulting. So uh, in Sanskrit, but I, I love to read out Shankara's original Sanskrit. Yatha matta gajaruda unmattam bhumishtam. Okay, yatha matta gajaruda. One who is on top of a raging elephant. So what is the raging elephant? It's the raging elephant of non-dualism. Unmattam bhumishtam. On the ground, a crazy, crazy person standing there. Prati gajar udo ayam gajang vahayam am prati. I am on my own elephant. Charge your elephant against mine. Let's have a good elephant fight. That man shouts. Then what does the man on the non-dual elephant do? Prati iti bruvanam api. Even being challenged like this. Tam prati na vahayati. Aviro da buddhya tadvat. He does not charge his elephant against that. Why? Because he sees no conflict there. If there was another elephant, he could have had a fight. But there's none. And therefore, he just passes by. So, in this way, Tataha Paramarthato Brahmavid Atmaiva Dvaitinam. Beautiful thing he says. Brahmavidam Atmaiva. From the non dualist point of view, all the dualists, whatever their philosophy, whatever their real, uh, uh, religion, they are all. My own self. They are not my brothers. They are not my countrymen. Or they are not my fellow, like we say, the, the brotherhood or sisterhood of humanity. Uh, we are all uh, children of God. Not even that. They are literally I myself. That is closest, this most direct oneness. You can't get in any other point of view. There, even the brotherhood of uh, humanity or whatever we talk about in United Nations, that's still pretty rhetorical. It's an ideal thing. Advaita Vedanta claims not just ideal, it is the reality. We are all one reality. All dualists of whatever persuasion, they are the very self of the non-dualist. The non-dualist says, you all who are my own very self. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, the question, you had uh, yeah, two questions. Come here, you first. Come to uh, yeah. And the way you're describing that dualistic religions cannot perceive non-dualism and it disturbs them. Uh, now that I am hearing this and I have a, at least a theoretical understanding of non-dualism, that, that thinking disturbs me a lot. Because what if there is some other reality that is even higher than Advaita that we Advaitans cannot perceive? Is there some anything? It's logically impossible. How can you go beyond non-duality? But then the how can you go? The how can you go be? Also how, argue that it's logically impossible for us to have anything higher because you know we just can't. No, it's, it's it's logically possible. You can't argue against logic. That against dualism, you can have oneness. Oneness is possible. If twoness is possible, oneness is also possible. But beyond oneness, what will you say? It's it's actually a settled fact. Nobody says anything. Even science, for example, I was at this uh, philosophy cafe uh, on uh, Monday, so we're discussing. And they said that in science and in philosophy, separation, dualism is taken as a defect. That you always try to find a uniting principle, always. So it, a science comes to an end when you have found the one explanation for everything. Here, it's not just every material phenomenon. It's the one explanation for the entirety of existence. Beyond that, what can you say? Not only that, this is regarded as an infinite reality beyond language. Now, beyond language and infinite, you can't have more than one of those. When you say beyond language and infinite, how can you distinguish two infinites which are beyond language? It would be the same thing. So, and that one is expressed as so many dualisms. It's exactly the meaning of what you see there. Truth is one, the sages call it variously. Yeah, Stan. If you 
We are going to come to that. Don't jump, jump ahead. <laughs> You're stealing my thunder. Oh, it's Sri Ramakrishna's thunder. Okay. Uh, quickly, anybody else had objections? I'll come to you. you had, uh, yeah. If scientists are able to solve the so-called hard problem of consciousness, which hmm. is, and they're able to prove that consciousness has a physical basis, yeah. they're in hot pursuit of that. Of hmm. course. Yeah. How would that affect our view of Advaita? Would that conflict with... Uh, very seriously. I would say it would conflict so very seriously. you're saying it would never happen, that they would be not be I think so, in principle. It. No, but my point is, it's good that you asked. I always, sometimes ask myself, this is a really serious question that we are asking for the first time, that uh, scientists are asking. And the hard problem is that how can a brain, a physical entity generate a first person experience like the conscious experience? They seem to be so different from each other. And so David Chalmers and others are saying it cannot. So we must think of consciousness in other terms. But the materialists, uh, so in, in the philosophy cafe uh, that day, the philosopher uh, who's Massimo from uh, CUNY, he's a biologist. So he is firmly convinced that consciousness is nothing more than a biological phenomenon. You find it in biological tissue, living brain tissue, and therefore in brains, not even tissue, in actual brains. Therefore, it must be a product of a brain, of, of a brain and nervous system. Only thing is, I can't, he, he says, or any, all the scientists agree, we can't show how it's happening, even begin to show how it's happening. But his point of view is, give us time. We will be able to show. That's called promissory materialism. Uh, I will show, give me time. No, but that's true. And he gives very good examples. We had a, I had a back and forth with him uh, on Monday. Interesting though, uh, let me just remark, is consciousness a fundamental property of the universe? That was the topic. Can you imagine how many people turned up? More than a hundred. Historians, neuroscientists, AI people. Um, there was this guy there sitting just in, in the same row where I was. He's got degrees from MIT and Stanford and he develops uh, AI uh, machines. Uh, people like that. And members of the public and philosophers from CUNY, Columbia. More than a hundred people that are interested in this. You see how much interest there is in this. This is a hot topic now. So we had a back and forth with him, um, with Massimo. This is the point. It's a very important point. He says, we'll be able to explain how at one time in the 19th century, 18th century, many leading thinkers thought life is something that is a, is a mysterious thing. Ilan Vital of, uh, Ilan Vital of Bergson uh, and uh, many others thought of it and something that science cannot explain. And he says, today, we have a very good understanding of life, down to the molecular level. It's a pretty satisfactory, we can't say a completely explained, but pretty good explanation. So like that, consciousness also will be inevitably explained. What is your objection to that? From Advaita perspective, you can see it's a very big objection. You can immediately see the objection. I don't think they can see the objection, scientists, but there is an objection. What is the objection? When you said life, I told him that. Look, from this point of view, from a first person point of view, we can all appreciate it. For you, life is an object. Something to be studied? Yeah, it's an object. <sighs> Breathing, all the physiological functions. You have explained a complex objective process in terms of more fundamental objective processes. Objects in terms of other objects, which is exactly what science does. But for the first time, you have come to something which is the subject. It's the pure subject. It's not a thing out there. To it, all thing, all are things. Now you're trying to say you'll be able to explain the subject in terms of objects. Brain and nervous system are objects. You're saying that the brain and nervous system will generate a subject. From an Advaitic point of view, that's what's called a category mistake. In philosophy, it's called a category mistake. This category mistake is obvious to the non-dualist from an Advaita point of view. It's not obvious to scientists. Why it's not obvious to scientists? For a scientist, everything is an object. I saw something ridiculous. I didn't point it out. The discussion was fierce. Do octopuses have con consciousness? If, if I replicate, is consciousness a pattern in the brain? So suppose I make a brain exactly like this living brain, but I make it out of cardboard. Will it be conscious? Um, if you, another person said, who works in systems theory or something. If you set up a complex chain of sensors, now it gathers information like we do. Would you call it conscious? Um, what about 
brain dead people or what about brain damaged people um, variety of things is this conscious is that conscious is this consciousness here is it there ai of course is a big question you know you know what was ridiculous and shocking to me why are you looking for consciousness in a second thing it's directly available to you in you yourself but you know the the very inertia of science is to find an object and study its properties so i'll find an object and study its property called consciousness directly are you not conscious you can't study a quark or a, um, a liver like that because it's an uh, object you have to study the object itself but consciousness is what you are in your consciousness you are doing science in your consciousness you are doing vedanta or religion theism atheism whatever it's all in consciousness consciousness is ever available to everybody all of us are conscious and you the scientist studying on the heart problem of consciousness you have direct access to consciousness within yourself in fact if you pursue it further see the logical problem the when you are looking at an octopus or a machine or a brain damaged person can you study consciousness there you are making again the same uh, error in principle you have got direct access to consciousness in your consciousness when you are conscious that is the not only that advait will point out something startling you have no access to consciousness anywhere else what you will what what you see the problem is they have made up their mind the reality is body and um, living tissue and cells and somehow it's producing consciousness now i will argue on that piece then you have already assumed the solution an octopus a brain damaged person a completely healthy person in nowhere nowhere will you have access to consciousness challenge that if you have understood what i am saying you will see that immediately it's impossible the moment you say an octopus or a brain also it's an object you don't i'm saying you don't even understand what consciousness is you don't know what you are talking about i see the discussion they cruise very easily from consciousness to mind to neurons and back and forth again without completely fuzzy discussion and that's not their fault that's the level at which consciousness studies is right now this distinction even the appreciation of what consciousness is you know the beauty of advaita is the more you begin to understand this the you are going towards enlightenment equally fast all you have to this understanding deepens into enlightenment that's all yes uh maharaj how can you uh, can you explain a little bit more how ancient uh, non dualist cosmic charvakian in that same topic that yeah there was a lot of debate um I have to think about it but many things they used um uh, for example one is coming to me right now if consciousness is a property of matter the ancient charvakas materialists say that this is what they are talking about now in ancient india one one of the objections was very interesting one which i came across recently if matter has consciousness or matter produces consciousness so the body produces consciousness the ancient materialists said that and modern scientists are also saying it in that case body is made of matter how much matter lots millions of cells billions of atoms why do you have one consciousness then why does in every body tall fat thin uh, indian chinese white black um, animal uh, dogs and cats everywhere why is it one consciousness it should you could you could think so we went i i uh, argue that i know what a biologist would uh, argue that it makes evolutionary sense if in one body there are multiple consciousnesses uh, then it would not such a thing would not survive how do you know evolution works by chance and natural selection you would have at, at least come across few animals which would have multiple consciousnesses and which did not survive maybe how do you know multiple consciousnesses may not be better than one consciousness if you have multiple advisors in your head but the this is the question and the, do you see the doubt if matter is producing consciousness you have a lot of matter in the body why only one consciousness is produced by matter is a see this is a very subtle argument and a powerful one even till today a modern evolutionary biologist won't be able to give an answer yes
because you have to remember, oh, I was conscious. Mm. How can you take that argument against materialism? I have to think about it, <laughs> I have to develop it. Yeah, consciousness in Advaita is ex experienced directly, right now. It's what we are experiencing. In fact, if you can sharpen the idea of what consciousness is, it's always available to us. All these things become very clear. What is consciousness and what is not consciousness? Very simple. If you ask in consciousness studies, give a definition of consciousness. They either fail or give you multiple definitions, each more complicated than the last. I can give you a straightforward definition. All of us would agree with right now. Will I give you the definition in Advaita? The definition of consciousness is that which is aware of objects. Whatever you are aware of or you can become aware of is not consciousness. It's an object to consciousness. Now think, the world, it's an object to you. Body, it's an object to you. Even mind, you see, by this knife, by using this definition as a knife, you can clearly see the difference between consciousness and mind. I pointed it out at the discussion. In modern consciousness studies, this distinction is blurred. Sometimes they're talking about thoughts, emotions, perceptions. Sometimes they're talking about consciousness. But the two are different. What's the difference between experience and consciousness? See how elegantly they have defined this. What is experience? Consciousness plus an object is experience. Think about, again, apply it to your own experience. When do you have an experience? You are awareness and an object comes in front of you. It could be a sight, smell, touch. It could be a thought, a memory, an idea, a desire. Then you have an experience. These definitions are directly based, they are called phenomenological, directly based on our, there, there can be, if you understand these experiences, your own experience of life will justify these experiences, these definitions. You see what these definitions mean, look at your own life, your life will justify these definitions. Am I making any headway in the scientific uh, community or not? Um, I am making some headway here I hope. <laughs> no, not in the scientific, I'll come to you, not in the scientific community. Professor Edwin Bryant was here. I asked him the same question that the Sankhyan point of view, you don't have to go to Advaita, Advaita is it's too much, too radical. But the Sankhyan point of view, which is very close to David Chalmers panpsychism, the Sankhyan point of view. So we have certain things to contribute to the modern debate on consciousness, very important insights. So how do we get this into the conversation? So Ed, Professor Bryant from um, Rutgers or Princeton, Rutgers, he was here. His answer was, they, have, they means the scientific community in the world. They have just started asking the question. Let them break their heads over it for the next 50 years and they will not get an answer. And then they, will, they might take it seriously. So that's the way things go. Where the hand up? Yes. You. This may be, uh, sound overly simplistic, but if I'm trying to understand or explain this, I would say it is only subject. It's, it's the pure subject. Yeah. Sure, only one. Only one. Not two, not two subjects. Not two subjects. Subject. Yes. There's only one subject. Yes. There's only one subject. Exactly. That's where the Advaita closes it. Um, Sankhya says there are many subjects. But if you question closely, the difference is based on body-mind, which are not subjective at all. Which are not, not subjects, they are objects. So it all reduces into one subject. We are one consciousness. Seem, work, channeled through many bodies and minds, we seem to be different. His example of pot and space. Just one more verse and I'm done. Oh, I didn't mention Sri Ramakrishna's. Let me take some time today. A little bit. 15 minutes or more. Verse number 19. Right? So why does this difference happen? Why does non-duality appear as duality? We know the answer or non-answer, maya. Maya ya bhidyate hetat Maya ya bhidyate hetat Nanyathajam kathanchana Nanyathajam kathanchana Tattvato bhidyamanehi Tattvato bhidyamanehi Matyatam amritam vrajet, matyatam ritam vrajet. This difference is due to maya. It's not a real difference. The non-dual reality does not become a dualistic universe. It appears to be a dualistic universe. Just like 
the rope does not become a snake or a computer cable or a uh, trickle of water. It appears like that, appears like that, experience like that. And practical use is also there. As I said, practical use, experience, name, everything. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara in Sanskrit. Those continue. But that does not mean it's real. Non-duality does not challenge your experience of the world. That you are seeing something, non-duality does not challenge it. Non-duality just asks you to examine the reality of what you are seeing. Non-duality does not challenge the experience. Non-duality challenges the reality. Is that real or is something else appearing as this? That you are seeing a waking world, that you see a dream world, that is not challenged. That would be foolish. I am seeing it, how will you challenge it? But what is it that you are seeing? I am not denying that you are seeing a snake. Examine it, you will see it's a rope. I am not denying that you are seeing a subject object. I am a subject experiencing an object. If you consider it through this non-dual reasoning, you will see it, it is one thing appearing as two. And we have this experience in dreams. Nobody denies that you saw things, you went to, you saw, met people, things happened. But then when you woke up, what happened? What, what do you say now? Oh, it was all in my mind. My mind alone became all those people. My mind alone became I the dreamer in the dream. And my mind itself enabled me to have so many experiences. All of that, all the time was my mind. That's the dream example. In this case, we are not talking about one mind imagining all this. It's consciousness in which, or being, existence, in which all of this is appearing. I'm, a, I'm asking you to hold on to, uh, to the idea that it does not contradict common sense, science, or even religion. It underlies all of them. Okay. Having said that, now let's go back to the... Okay, one more thing here, the second line. All this appears due to Maya, and what is Maya, don't ask. I have a whole talk coming up on it. Swami Vivekananda gave three talks. So I'm going to have a whole talk coming up on it in later in March yeah. on Maya. Tattvato vidya manehi matyatam amritam brajet. He says, supposing really all this had emerged, a universe and individual beings had emerged, then what would happen? Then immortality would be lost. If a cause actually produced an effect, if there is change, you know, the changes would take effect then God would die. There would be birth and death and uh, old age and uh, decay. Things would be subject to real change. If there is real change, how can there be non-duality or any kind of freedom possible? Whatever you attain to will again change it. So the change is not denied, but its reality is denied. That This thing is beyond this changeful dualistic universe. If you admit dualism to be the ultimate truth, what he is saying, then immortality is also impossible. What the dualistic religions promise is a logical impossibility. If really you are born, if really you are a body, and you died, and you are made immortal, you can again die. If those things really happen, they can really happen again. Okay. Stop there. <clears throat> One additional note I want to add from Sri Ramakrishna's point of view. Five, <coughs> five quick points. What Sri Ramakrishna's take? With all respect to Gaudapada, as you can see, except if you are a hyper-intellectual, a committed non-dualist, um, you would find it insulting, Gaudapada's position. If you are told, oh, we accept your position, but it's the base camp. Ours is the peak of the mountain. It's useful to climb up to the peak. Um, how? I'm happy with it because I can go from base camp to the peak. But if somebody says, that one is my reality, I love my Krishna and that's it. Wouldn't that person find it insulting to be called that your whole religion is base camp for us, is step one for us. So that's like putting down, a condescending approach. Still far better than the, non -dual, the dualist approach, which regards others as false, to be killed, murdered, converted or whatever. It, this is far better. It's, it's a much more gentlemanly approach. But Sri Ramakrishna's approach, I find it today. So today when I was in the interfaith conference, if I said this, it would have created a riot. <laughs> Non-dualist and all the other religions are just base camp or just manifestation. And nobody would have understood. Luckily, it wouldn't have created a riot. Nobody would understand what I'm talking about. Um, but Sri Ramakrishna's approach is genuinely uh, something which is wonderful and effective in the modern world. I've seen people really accepting this. Um, 
quickly five points. What is Sri Ramakrishna's approach? His whole take on the spiritual life and harmony of religions and everything. First, the ultimate reality, God, Brahman, is both personal and impersonal, transcendent and immanent. It's not that the impersonal is the reality and the personal is, is a lower reality. That's what non-dual Godapada would say. A dualist would say personal is the only reality and your impersonal is a falsehood. No. Impersonal also real, personal also real. Completely transcendent beyond this world also real. That same thing is nothing other than this world itself, appearing as this world. Transcendent and immanent. That is the ultimate reality. Okay, number one. Point number two. To realize that is the goal of all religions and the goal of all life. The purpose of life is to realize is a general term, deliberately so. You can call finding your oneness with that, I am that, that's realization. But I want to live close to that as an individual being and that is my personal God, that's also realization. I want to spend an eternity with my beloved Krishna or my Christ, that's also realization. Why not? And the proof is that people have experienced these things or uh, mystics of different religions. They have experienced enlightenment in different ways. So the second point is that to realize this, uh, this reality, this ultimate reality is the goal of religions, is the goal of human life. What are religions for? For that. For that. That's the point of religions. Not to unite and fight with each other. Not to do politics. Not to save the environment. They can do all that. They can do politics, save the environment, fight with each other also. Hopefully not. But that is not the purpose of religions. You might even people are confused. What is the point of religion? The point of ulti religions ultimately is transcendence, liberation, whatever you call it. Every religion has a term. Salvation, nirvana, moksha, whatever. That is the point. And what is that? It's realization of this ultimate reality. It is also the purpose of life itself. If you ask, generally, what are we here for? What's going on? Sri Ramakrishna's view is, this God realization is the purpose of life. Proof, if you do it, if you get it, you will be completely and totally fulfilled forever. Proof, look at the lives of the great saints in all religious traditions. One thing is common, they were so diverse, but one thing is common to all of them. They didn't complain. They had no more grumbling and complaining about life. They had found something which took them beyond suffering, which gave them ultimate meaning. Even in suffering, even in death, even in the most tragic persecution, they found some very deep meaning which enabled them to transcend all this. So that is the purpose of life also, second point. Third, this is an easy one. Then what about the differences in religions? There are all different paths to this realization. So this path metaphor, different paths of up a mountain, or um, the truth is one, sages call it variously, or the same body of water, different people have different names, water and, and pani and jal, different words for the same reality. So different religions are, they are different. People accuse us in the Ramakrishna order of saying that everything is the same. We don't say that. See, Ramakrishna never said it. He said they are different from each other and it's good that they are different. Why would you want all paths to be one path? All paths are different, but they all lead you to ultimate transcendence. I will not even say the same goal, the same ultimate end of human life. Transcendence, freedom, liberation. If I say same goal, some people might object. No, my goal is different from you. All right, but does your goal finally satisfy you? You have to say yes. <laughs> yes. Good. Then, fourth point. Um, in all this diversity, you are fully justified to think of your path as the best. Yes, you are allowed to think of that. You must have your own ishta, chosen ideal, and your own way of practice. You must have it. Swami Vivekananda said, let the sects multiply until every human being has a sect of his or her own. That's good. As long as you don't have to have sectarianism fighting against each other. They're all good. I was noticing Sri Ramakrishna, he never criticized in any religion, never. And yet, he did criticize. I noticed one thing. He criticized quarreling in the name of religion. He says, those who quarrel in the name of religion are not serious about religion. They have other agendas. So, third is, one must, uh, fourth, one must have a path 
you can be loyal to your path. Somebody asked me, can I think my religion is the best? I said, in the UN I said it. Not only you can think that your religion is the best, you must think it. <coughs> if you go to a shop and you buy your cereals, your particular brand, you certainly think that's the best one. Otherwise, why would you buy it? You choose something out of a wide range only because you think it's good, it's really good for me. But that doesn't mean the other person also can't choose the other, another thing and think that's the best one for him or her. So you must think your religion is the best or your path is the best for you. Then the fifth point is important. As Sri Ramakrishna says, as many faiths, so many paths. So one must have respect for all paths. Point number five. Four, loyalty to your own path and sincere practice. Five, respect for all paths. Not tolerance, acceptance. Not only that, not, don't be in your own little ivory tower. Learn from other paths. Learn your path seriously and learn. You will enjoy it. Sri Ramakrishna said, if you take a pancake and eat it this way or that way or that way, it tastes equally good. Learn to, some Swami Tapasyanti called Sri Ramakrishna. He was a glutton for God. He wanted to taste God in so many ways. You learn from other religions. It will strengthen your practice. Today we are lucky to live in a world where the common spiritual heritage of humanity is our heritage. Thanks to um, this free society we are living in, information freely available. It's all available to us. Don't get confused. That's a danger. Confusion is a danger. But you can take advantage of it. So these are the five points. Sri Ramakrishna's view of religion. Ultimate reality, not just this, but always they can be considered ultimate reality. How you can reconcile them? See, there's an objection. This, this is a logical way of looking at it. But if you say all the dualistic realities talked about by these religions are all equally true, then it becomes a little illogical. That's what Ayanma is trying to reconcile. Yeah. But Sri Ramakrishna was not doing logic. He saw something and he told us, this is true. It works. He was very pragmatic. Look at the lives of the saints. It works. If they follow their own path, do they not become holy? Yes, they do. Then, um, second point, that the purpose is to realize this. Purpose of religion, purpose of life. Third point, all are paths. They are all true. They are all paths to that realization. That means they are all true and they are also, they are not important in themselves. They are a way of uh, realizing. Fourth, be sincere to your own practice. Fifth, respect, accept and learn from other traditions. Love other traditions. You see, for me, if I disrespect God in some other form, in some other religion, it's exactly for me the same as disrespecting Sri Ramakrishna. You say, what about Brahman? Brahman you can disrespect. Brahman doesn't care. <laughs> You are Brahman. If you disrespect Brahman, you are, <laughs> you are disrespecting me, your own self. It, it has no reaction at all. You are a little in awe of God. So disrespecting God is a bad thing. So if I disrespect God in any religion, literally, I'm honestly telling you, it's exactly the same thing as insulting uh, God in the form I worship. Okay. Just let's hear the question. Saguna, yes. It's not like uh, Saguna is a real Brahman and Nirgun is less of Brahman. No, it's the opposite. Yes. Uh, in Advaita Vedanta, God, I'm back to Gaudapada again. Gaudapada would say Nirguna Brahman is the reality, Saguna is an appearance, is a, is a relative reality. Yes. Gaudapada would say Nirguna is the reality, it is the ultimate reality. So Gaudapada has a two step approach to it. Sri Ramakrishna would say both are real. If you say that, no, no, logically, how can both be real? He said, don't worry about logic, realize God in whichever way <laughs> suits. Somebody asked Swami Turiyananda, what was Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy? Non-dualism, dualism, qualified monism. And Swami Turiyananda said, if you push me, if you press me for an answer, give me one answer, then I would say his philosophy was, in whatever way possible, in whatever manner possible, realize God in this very life itself and be free that's the that's the philosophy all right om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu